Okay, so for the airbrush part, the airbrush part is really blending all that paintbrush work together. If you take a step back and look at it right now, I mean, it, it reads the way it's supposed to read, um, but it, it, there's that element of really that hard edge that the paintbrush gives that we want to kind of blend out. If you look at an area like, like, the, the, like the, the top of the motor here, um, it really is blended out you know, it, it, with all that airbrush work, and it really ties it all together. That's really what we're going for in the other section. So we're gonna, we're gonna start with that. So to get that done, again, this is where knowing what the rules are so you can break them. S generally, with Createx paint, they recommend um, a reduction of about 10, maybe 20% tops, and the paint works really, really well. To get the kind of blends that I'm looking for on this and that really subtle, like, like really fine, tight detail, I tend to go way, way over that. Now that's fine as long as you understand what it's going to do to the paint. If you take straight paint and just reduce it crazy, you reduce the amount of binder, it generally will dry faster, it won't adhere as well. Um, so you have to kind of balance it with a few things. So the way I do that is I mix up 40, 50, and 40, 11 um, beforehand. And this is 40, 50, and 40, 11 in a one to 10 ratio. So there's one part of 40, 50 to 10 parts of reducer. Again, this is way over the reduction ratios that they recommend. It produces this almost like the consistency of um, like whole milk. Um, and that's what it is, is basically it's just spiked reducer. Uh, you can't really call it 4050 anymore. It's really just reducer with 4050 in it. But what I do is I have different ratios of that same thing. So here is a 1 to 2 mixture of 4050 and 4011, which is much thicker. And this is one part 4050 to two parts reducer. And I have all different kinds. So there is a 2 to 1, which is mostly 4050, two parts 4050 to one part 4011. And I mix up a small amount of these. These bottles are only about, these are an ounce bottle. And I only mix up about, you know, I'd say an eighth of, of the bottle. And you do that because, two reasons. One, it gives you this mixture ready to go. But by mixing up a small amount, it's the same kind of thing as the palette. You don't want to mix up too much of this because as soon as you add reducer to anything, the paint or 4050, it kind of starts the clock ticking on this paint or on the, on the, the medium, the 4050 in this case. So I would rather run out of this and have to mix up a little bit more than to um, mix up a whole one ounce of this and then have it start to you know, kind of set up and dry. So you just mix up a little bit of this. I put a little mixing ball in there and that really keeps things mixed up really well. And again, it just adds this kind of whole thing together. The other big reason I do this beforehand is because when you mix 40, 50, and 40, 11, there's generally about a 10 minute window, or not window, but a 10 minute wait time while all the reducer kind of emulsifies with that 40, 50. By pre-mixing this, you basically set that up so that it's always ready to go. Uh, you don't have to wait the 10 minutes at all because it's already mixed up. So that's kind of how that works. And this is what I do when I'm airbrushing so I can get this kind of to work really fast. One other quick note before I get too far into this is paint strainers. So I, I strain all these paints as I use them. And the reason why is because as these bottles get older, paint will dry on the top of the bottle and on the inside where the air is. And what happens is, is little bits of that paint will flake off and end up back in the bottle. So I usually use a small paint strainer. This one's a reusable one that was made for me. And um, you can use um, different materials, but using the actual paint strainers are really nice because you can get the openings just the way you want them. So 200 micron is uh, generally what we recommend for the, the, uh, the Createx paints, uh, and then um, smaller for the candies. Uh, but this really removes all the foreign matter and all those little bits of you know, weirdness that are going to be in the bottle of paint as you have an older bottle. On a bigger application of paint and a bigger airbrush, you, you know, taking out the tiniest, tiniest bits of paint won't really make a difference, but when you're dealing with a really small area, a small bit of paint can really kind of give you fits. So, all right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the same cobalt blue black mix on this. Uh, there are two colors that I'll use to blend in here. 
And the first one is that slate blue, that kind of blackish blue. It's opaque black and uh, cobalt blue. The other color that I use a lot for this blending is more of a warmer color. So that's going to be um, the red oxide and a little bit of black as well. Uh, burnt umber is another very favorite color of mine. So burnt umber and black makes a really nice warm black for doing a lot of this blending. But the first thing we're going to do is we're going to start with the blue. We're going to hit the sky and get some of those things and we'll use that as much as we can. So what that is, is for this I want a pretty thin mix. So I'm going to go with the 10 to 1 or 1 to 10, one part 40, 50 and one uh, 10 parts 40 11 and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour this in the airbrush and strain it off to the side because I don't well I'd love to show you guys I also don't want to do this right over the painting because if I miss and I get you know mess on the painting it's just going to be something I have to figure out so So I put the mix in first, the 40-50 the mix in the paintbrush first, or in the airbrush first, and then uh, what I'll do is on the palette, I'll squeeze out a little bit of the blue, and with the paintbrush, I'll actually get a little bit of paint from the palette, because I don't need a whole drop of paint. A whole drop of paint would really be too much on this. So I'll grab a little drop of paint from the palette, and that's what I'll use to mix this in. And this will produce a really reduced bla uh, blue. And it's real transparent, but what I'm doing is because I've added that mix, I still have the 4050 in there. That increases its strength, increases its ability to spray real nice, and it's still reduced. It's very thin. By adding that tiny bit of paint, the, the consistency of that is still just about what like heavy, like, like whole milk would be, which is, which is nice. It'll give me a good mix. And what I'm also going to do here is, to make that the slate black, I've dipped the paint in the black again. And I'm going to just mix that in and that will give me this slate blue that I'll use to kind of blend everything together. So the paintbrush, or the airbrush for this uh, type of work, I'm using the Iwata Custom Micron C. Um, you can do this type of work on the scale with uh, just about anything detail-oriented airbrushes. I would recommend something no bigger than, say, a 0.3 millimeter nozzle. Um, however, airbrushes and, and, and paint is, is really, they go, really go hand in hand. You could do something like this with, say, a 0.35 millimeter brush, like, uh, like an Iwata Eclipse CS. Um, but you need the paint to be a little bit thicker so it doesn't flow as fast. The nice thing about the small detail brushes are they really put out paint in a very small, controlled way. It's not great for doing big areas, but they're not meant for that either. So that is, that's what the, the Micron really excels at. All right, so I'm going to test this off to the side. Make sure this is working, and it is. So what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start with the fade on the top. It's a good chance for me to kind of do a bigger area before I get into doing any of the details. And the light's a little bit too here so that we get less shadows on here. There we go. Um, so it's nice to pick a bigger area to start. Uh, that way I can really test out the brush and make sure it's working the right way before I really start digging into some of the finer, smaller areas. So I'll start with the top area and the trick here is to make as many passes as you can. I'd way, way rather put this on lighter and build it up than to try to nail it all at once. Because it's always easier, you've heard a million people say it a million times, it's always easier to add than it is to subtract. So what I'm doing is just making multiple passes, kind of concentrating on the top edge, but then kind of fading it down as I go. And that will give me that, that really subtle fade that, that, uh, that I'm looking for, for that, you know, as the sky kind of turns over. Now that I know that, that that paint is really working the way I need it to, I'll start doing some of the tighter areas. There's a fade on the front of this air cleaner right here. So now that I know the paint is performing the way I need it to perform, I can kind of start getting in tighter and getting these areas here. 
So yeah, the beauty of mixing up these colors or the mixing up the uh, 40, 50 and the reducer beforehand, you have a consistent mix. So you have a you know, 20 to one mix or 10 to one mix and it's always the same. While that all won't always translate to working with the paint the right way, and what I mean by that is every paint has almost like a different character to it. White, white sprays differently than black and that sprays differently than yellow ochre and blue and all that. It does give you a baseline of reducer to, to 40, 50 that you can start with. So you'll know that say, white has a harder time spraying. So I'm gonna use a little bit, you know, I use a 40 or the 40, 50 mix that has 20 to one, for instance, instead of say 10 to one. And it'll give you that baseline where you're not always guessing. Once you get it down, you'll be like, okay, if I'm gonna do details with white, I know I'm grabbing the 20 to one. Or if I'm doing black, I can use 10 to one. Um, so it really gives you that, um, that you know, really nice way to kind of, kind of keep things sane. Okay, so before I go on, I should mention how I mix those up. These little mixing cups are great for that. These are little medicine mixing cups, and normally a paint, uh, when you're mixing paint to certain ratios, you'd use bigger mixing cups that have the ratios on them. When you're mixing tiny amounts of paint, these little medicine cups work really, really well. They're gradated, they have the, the, the mixture on them or the, the amounts on them. So all you really have to do is kind of do the math on your own. You don't have to be perfect. If I'm mixing up, say, a 20 to one mix, um, if I get somewhere between 20 and on the sh just over 20 to get you know, to that 20 to one mixture, uh, that's really all you need to do. It doesn't have to be perfect um, if you're close enough. Uh, that's good. There's a 212.5 mix, so if I'm doing 10 to 1, I can bring the reducer up to 10 and then add a little bit more paint to it to get about halfway, and that's going to be close to 10 to 1. Same thing with 5 to 1. You know, you get close to that. Um, it really gives you, you know, it puts you in the ballpark. It doesn't have to be perfect, but these little cups make a, make a great way to kind of mix that up. Uh, and also keeps you from mixing up, you know, a gallon of this stuff, which you don't want. All right, so this is really working out well. All right, so let me do a little bit on the foot pad here. So with this blue, I can start by dragging out that fade. I don't want to go crazy because this is going to have the black on it too when I airbrush, but this blue will really kind of start that fade for me. And I'm just using, a, well, it's a fade stroke. So as I'm starting the paint on the dark side of this pad, I'm just fading it out as I kind of bring it across. And again, multiple passes over and over and over again. I'd rather really slowly build it up than to try to nail it in one shot. There's no, no reason to do that. Okay, same thing with the, with the area of the, the shadow on the pants. This is going to be a little bit of both. This color and also that burnt umber black mix. So I can start by just kind of like bleeding in some of the fades. So what I'm doing is I'm just kind of working over the paintbrush strokes. This blue I'm also going to introduce in the skin tone as well. And I know that sounds weird, but this works as a great, this blue against the, the, uh, against this, the warmth of the skin tone will produce this really nice gray because they cancel each other out as the way they are on the color wheel. So this blue-black mix will really work well to kind of start that, that shadow. It'll cool off that skin tone. And that's what's going on. The reflections from the bike are hitting my hand in the reflection, so they're naturally cool. So this will be a good way to start that. Okay, so for the fun stuff, like up in this, I have no idea what this is. It looks like it's part of the trees. It's part of the bike too, this, this weird shape up here. So with this, again, this is where an airbrush like this really excels. It, you can just breathe the paint out. I mean, you think paint and it comes out of the brush that way. I'm running it about, I'd say this is about 10 or 15 pounds of pressure. I love to run this paint at a higher pressure um, because it just helps the paint break off the airbrush really well and atomize really nicely. But because this color here that I've mixed up is so thin, um, I'd rather not have a ton of air. So this is dialed down. 
So I'm just kind of mixing in this blue where the trees are and those other, whatever those other details are, I have no idea what they are. Okay, and speaking of trees, run across the air cleaner and again, just kind of start blending those paintbrush strokes that I used for the for the trees and start blending them. As long as I'm going really lightly with the blue, the blue will always just kind of play really well with the green that's in there anyway. So I don't have to worry. I don't want to do too much of it because I don't want to overpower it. I'm also going to set up a little bit here. This black plastic 103 panel has blue highlights underneath it. So I'm going to kind of cheat right now and base that darker area in the bottom with blue. What's going to happen is when I spray white over this later, it's going to pick up that blue and shift, and that's what I really want because I'll that will then become a, this really pale blue highlight underneath. It's kind of secondary reflection. Also around the screw, I kind of dropped the ball and didn't do the, the rest of the details around it. So I'm just going to kind of base the whole thing in blue and then I'll go back in after with the paintbrush when I'm doing the highlights and finish them up. Okay. Another good candidate for this blue is the shadow on the ground that I, that I cast when I took the photo. Now this is impossible to see, but this, is, this works the same way as the blue I just sprayed in the black panel. What's going to happen here is when I go to lighten that up after, that blue will pop out and that'll, that'll give me the, the coolness that I need on that. So I think we are good. Oh, I want more blue up here because you can see the reflection of the tank in the top of this. So we'll base this out with blue as well. So depending on what kind of day I'm having, will determine really how I get this stuff done. Sometimes I want to do this, like if I have this stage, I'll want to do this everywhere on the painting. Uh, sometimes I'll just take one section and finish it completely. And like I said, it all depends on, you know, like kind of how I'm feeling and, and, you know, what I want to get done for that day. All right, so one last section for this blue. And that's going to be in the ground here. I want to use this really sparingly though. All I'm going to do with the blue is to kind of hit the areas that are in the creases um, of the actual air cleaner. So I'm just going to really lightly go over it until I just start to see that change in, in tone. And that's, that's it. So that'll help to kind of set up the, the curves that are going on in that. All right, I'm going to switch colors and then I'm going to grab that black and be right back. All right, so I've loaded in the black and burnt umber. It's the same deal with this. So it's a 20 to 1 mixture, which is 20 parts reducer and one part 40-50. And uh, again, that's way, way over in a normal reduction. But for this type, I really fine fade and really transparent look, um, that, it's really going to work out fine. All that's going to be locked in with the clear at the end of it. So uh, it's really not as big of an issue as you may think over reducing it. But this is, um, again, burnt umber and opaque black. Same kind of thing, just a really, really super transparent uh, color. Um, the new opaque black is really warm. The new opaque jet black is really warm anyway. But uh, the, the burnt umber just adds a little bit more brown to it. So again, same thing, try to test it out in an area that, you know, I can get away with if it's, if something's not quite right with it. And this is actually looking really good. So this will act like a, more like a gray. Actually, I think I might have to go a little bit more transparent with this because this is, this is really kind of bold, which is good. But so what we're going to do, instead of just adding more reducer, going to jump back to that 1 to 20 mixture because this is basically reducer with a tiny splash of 40-50 at this ratio. I'll just mix that in and then what I can do is with a paper towel just kind of push the needle into the paper towel and then bubble that back up and that'll mix it in. 
So you can see how transparent that is. Okay. So this color is a color that will fill the gap between the airbrushed blue parts and then the, the paintbrush parts. So anywhere where I need to tone down that blue, what's nice about the warmth of the burnt umber is that'll kind of cancel any of the real primary blue that's that like maybe too much. So I can really kind of tone that down with this burnt umber color. And we we're talking about on the, the foot pad here where that fade is really subtle. All that's done between the, the blue airbrushed part and now this burnt umber over it. So it'll produce this just kind of really neutral kind of fade, which is what we're looking for. So again, just kind of run around the whole thing, pick the areas that need that, and this looks pretty good. There isn't too much of that that needs to go on here. A couple different checks and we're good. All right, so the next part from here, I'm gonna leave that in the brush just in case I need it again. The next part is I'm gonna start pulling out those really bright white highlights. And this is the fun part. This is really the frosting on the cake kind of thing. And what I do is it's the same deal. It's um, I palette a little bit of white out White, not white out. You don't want to use white out on your paintings. Um, I'll put a little bit of opaque white on the palette and then a little bit of reducer. Um, again, the opaque white doesn't need the 4050 in it, so I can just reduce it with the palette, with, with, the, with the paintbrush. So from here, I want to start with, actually, I'll grab my paper towel again so I'm not putting my grubby mitts all over the painting. I want to start picking the brightest highlights. And again, I pick them in spots where I can get away with it if this paint isn't palleted right. Like I don't want to start with the major highlights because if this isn't palleted right and it you know, has a problem, I'd rather start it on a spot that I can easily fix it, like on this edge here. So I'm just going to drop. This is working out really well as, as it, you know, usually it's pretty straight ahead, but you don't want to take a chance. So I'll start throwing in all these highlights and any corrections that I need to make along the way too. Sometimes like on this, you know, I'll find little areas that, that, that I missed as I'm kind of working, so I can add those in as well. This is, this is opaque white straight, so I want to be kind of careful with it. I don't want to go too crazy with it. Again, it's, it's just like frosting, you know? Everyone loves, well, I don't know if everyone loves frosting, but most people love frosting. But if you have a cake that's entirely made of frosting, um, it's, it's not the best thing in the world. So it's the same thing with these highlights. You want to be kind of sparing with them. The, the, the more you have, the less impact they have, if that makes any sense. So if you start putting them everywhere and just go nuts with it, you actually reduce their impact and how, how they play out. It's better to put less of them than more. Um, so just every time it dries out, just repallet it and drop a few more in. And I'm saving the biggest ones for the end just drop those in last. Anywhere where there's like, you know, a bigger area, like in this, the corner, this is actually, the section here is actually the reflection of the, the exhaust pipe. And uh, that has a large highlight on it. So you just kind of paint it in roughly. It's gonna be really like bright, like it's glowing when we're done. Uh, but again, this acts as the, the primer, the base. It's just so if you tried to do these with the airbrush, they'd all be soft and fuzzy and you'd have to really put a lot of paint on to build them up to opacity. So we're just giving the airbrush a head start by kind of hitting all these with the, uh, with the paintbrush first. Anywhere where they'll, they'll appear is where we kind of want to drop them in. There's even some on the plastic edge of this uh, air cleaner too, the rubber edge. So the biggest highlights on this thing are right here. And these are gonna take a few applications of paint just because this paint is fairly thin because I palleted it way out to get it to flow nicely, especially this highlight up here. This highlight up here is pretty big. It's one of the main highlights in the painting. So I'm gonna hit it and then I'm just gonna leave it and let it dry out. Kind of flares out here. So while that's drying, I'll run around the rest of the painting and throw a few more in. You see right here how this highlight, which I just painted in, kind of turned blue. That's the thinness of that paint. As it dries, it just allow the blue from underneath to kind of appear again. It's not completely saturated with paint. 
So we just kind of keep going over it. What I don't want to do is just mix it up real thick and put a blob of paint on that. Just like the airbrush, I want to build this up in layers, especially with the paintbrush, because I don't want a physical mound of paint there. Uh, it just makes, you know, it, it just adds dimension that you don't want. Again, these paintings are small, so when people look at them, they're right on top of them, and you'd be surprised how much of that stuff shows up. Um, so I want to make sure that we kind of take our time and kind of get it in the right way. So every time it dries, it turns like a, like a, like a pale blue. So I'll just keep going over it till I reach saturation with that. And there are highlights on my hand here. That looks good. There's a real thin line here. So I'm gonna see if I have enough paint in here to do it. And I don't, oh no, I do. So again, that paint is gonna dry in that brush because it's what paint does. So sometimes I can you know, pull a small line, sometimes I'd have to repallette the brush to get it back out to the point where it flows, but you just kind of play it as it is. When I do the 103, I'll have to repallette the brush, but uh, we'll do that last before we switch out to the airbrush. But we are almost set with this whole section, which is kind of nice. A couple more highlights. There's another highlight up here too. Yeah. There we go. So that's good. These big highlights here have finally kind of got to saturation. As I'm letting them dry, they're pretty much staying white. So that's that's a great that's a great sign. That's just where you want them. I'll go them a couple other times just to make sure they're really locked in. I'm going to hit them with the airbrush and make them really glow. But again, I, I want to make sure they're at saturation. They're fully white by the time I get there. Because if I go and try to put the the, just the airbrush spot on there, I'd have to build it up so it was saturated and then it would just, you know, kind of get out of control. Just make it, you know, bigger and bigger until it's out of control. So we don't want that. All right, so finally the 103. So this is where it's fun. There are two ways that, or two things that I do to get this to work. And I kind of take the pressure off myself by doing it this way. It's, uh, the 103 is on a black background, pretty much a black background. So what's nice about that is I'll be able to make corrections to, to the white as I go. So I want to try to get it, I want to try to get it right, but I also am not overly worried about having everything be perfect on this first pass, because I'll go back in and clean it up after. So again, this is opaque white, and the beauty of this is um, it really does cover very well. So I have this palleted out, but this isn't as thin as what I had the highlights at, because I do kind of want this to cover pretty well the first time. I don't want to have to keep going over this, because uh, this is really more of a one-shot type thing, where, you know, if you get it, if you get it in there nice and neat and clean, you don't have to do too much work to it after. Now, what I am going to do is I am going to turn it this way. Again, it's that range of motion thing. My hand really wants to work up and down more than side to side. And what's nice about it is the stencil is kind of laid that out for me in the beginning. So I really didn't have to guess as I was kind of laying this out. It was the HD stencil did a great job of kind of putting everything where it should be. You'll also notice I'm not, I mean, I'm trying to stay in, you know, in those lines and keep it clean. But you'll see in a second, I don't have to be like right on the money. I'll be able to clean all that up. And the one, yeah, the three and the zero are attached. So again, if I made a mistake, like I cut off the bottom of the three right there, where it's not, it runs right into the zero, I can fix that in a second. So what I wanna make sure is before I move on to the black now, again, now that this is dried, the 103, I wanna check for places in here where it kinda of grayed out, where I didn't have complete saturation. And any place like that, I'll just go over real, real quick again just to kind of get that to 100% saturation. And again, I'm not really, I'm trying to stay clean and tight, but don't really have to worry too much about it because the next stage will clean all that up. That looks pretty good. Okay, perfect. Clean off the brush a little bit. 
So now I'm going to switch to black. Now, the black isn't 100% saturation here on the background, so I don't want to... I want to make sure that this is palleted out a bit with a bit of 40-50 because what I want is I want that black to be black, but I also want it to be slightly transparent. And that will help me in that when I go to start cleaning up the edges that you won't see this black outline around everything. So on the side here, you can't really see it, but it's the same thing. I'm just palleting out the black on the brush, but I'm adding a little bit of that burnt umber to it and the 40-50. So with that, it gives me kind of a warm brown, but it's also semi-transparent. It's still pretty opaque, but it's got some transparency to it, so it'll help me clean up these edges and cover the mistakes that I made with the white, but it's not so like deep jet black like it is out of the bottle that it'll leave this black outline around the whole thing, which it would. It's, the opaque paint really is strong that way, so I kind of temper it. Still want it to do its job, but I want to kind of temper its ability to kind of be nighttime black. And I screwed that up too. Excellent. I love screw ups. So the one has a, uh, the one doesn't go like that. The one actually goes right across. So I'm going to fix this by kind of going back to the white real quick and then just connecting that the way it should be. There we go. That's better. So any of the other fixes that I have to do around that will be, well, again, with the black. And the, the, all these paintings, they, they are all, this is exactly what it is. It's all back and forth. It's always a tractor pull. You know, it's just back and forth. It's never that you do something for me. It's it never that I never just put it down and it's right automatically. I mean, sometimes things work out great and things kind of come together the way they should. But more likely than not, it's a back and forth, and that's fine. Because what happens is it gets you in the mindset that you know anything that happens can be fixed, and that's amazingly powerful. So if you if you're totally wound up about, I got to get this right. It's got to be perfect on the first shot, or else it's garbage. It can really put a lot of pressure on what you're doing. But if you know you can fix anything, if you know that you can like, you know, just kind of solve a problem that kind of pops up. Um, it just frees you when you're working. You know, you know that you, you can you can just kind of mess around with stuff and you can make stuff work. So it's it's a nice thing. And this paint really does a great job at that because you have the ability to work really transparently. Or if you need it super opaque, you can do that too. So it gives you a lot of options to kind of mess around with. All right, so I'm just running around the edge of this and cleaning up those edges and making it look like I hit it the first time exactly right. And of course, I'll tell everyone that I hit it exactly right the first time and it came out perfect, which I won't do that. I'm only kidding. All right. So there we go. And again, that, that has this, this black has some transparency to it so that, you know, as I kind of push it out into the background, I'm not getting this just black outline. And it works the same way here. If something gets screwed up here as I'm fixing it with the black and I have to jump back to the white, like where the one and the zero are together, I kind of I kind of cut into that white a little bit too much. Um, you just go back into the white and throw it back in. It's just, like I said, it's, it's all back and forth. It's just until it's, until it's right. So a little bit of white there and then I can finish that corner and we're in good shape. So from here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump to the airbrush and then I'll put in all the highlights and the section will be pretty much done. And a little bit there too. I'm gonna turn this so you can see it upright and there we go. I may do a little bit more work to that just to kind of finish cleaning up, but for now we'll get on to the, the fun part, the white highlights. So I'll be back in a minute. I'm gonna swap out and put some white in the brush and we'll be ready to go. All right, so the final, final bit, the real frosting on the cake is lighting up these highlights with white. Same deal here, you know, I, the, the opaque white sprays amazingly, almost right out of the bottle, even with a micron. But what I really want is a whole ton of control as I start to light these highlights up. Um, the opaque paint covers so well, I really want, you know, that to be a little bit more transparent. The nice thing about the opaque white is you don't need to add the 40, 50 to it um, to keep its strength really there. It's designed to just be uh, reduced, which is really nice. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna start with these two big highlights here. And then same thing here. 
too much is always too much. So you wanna kinda of limit, it's so much fun to do this part, but you wanna really kinda of limit how much of it you do just so you don't over, over kind of work the whole thing. So I'm gonna start with this top highlight and what I wanna do is I just wanna kinda of start that paint flowing just so I know I'm kind of in the right spot and then very lightly pull the trigger back and as the paint starts to come out, I stop and let it dry. So I just let the air flow onto it. And then as soon as that's dry, and you can tell, you can see the, the uh, wetness of the paint. Um, as soon as that's dry, then I can add a little bit more. I definitely don't want to just flood this on because this paint is so thin, it'll immediately spider web. And the problem, obviously, with that is I'm doing this on this really nice blue fade. If I have a spider web of white paint go across this, I literally have to redo that whole section. So it's not something I really want. So it, that is the real balance right there. It's being able to have control over that paint, have it be able to spray really transparently and in control layers, but to be able to control it as well. So you gotta re really work with a lot of patience with it. So just let it kind of appear on the surface and then stop and let it dry. Again, it's so much easier to add more of this than to try to, you can't, you can't repair this. You would have to redo the whole section. So if I were to blast a bunch of white paint on there and really put too much, there's not much I could do. I couldn't go back in with the blue and, you know, kind of tuck back into it and try to, you know, lessen it. I'd really have to repaint that whole section. So I really want to take it slow. So next section, the same thing. I'm going to let this one sit up here for a little bit. I'm going to start working on this other large reflection right here, highlight. Uh, and the same thing, just let it go, kind of let it dry, and then pick it up again. And I'm almost looking at this at an angle, so I can't really see the white. All I can see is the wet paint. So as it appears on the surface, I get it to the point where it, I can see the white paint, the wet paint, and then I stop and let it dry. And it dries to a dull, kind of a matte finish, which is really nice and easy to see. And there we go. So that one's done now, too. So I got those two. I'm going to hit this other top one in a minute, but I'm going to just kind of run around and grab some of the other ones real quick and again it's the same deal now that the I know that the paint is flowing the right way on these big ones which are easy to kind of control because they're larger now that I know that the paint is flowing the right way and I've gotten used to it I can start tackling these little ones you wouldn't want to start with the little ones only because you know if the paint isn't quite right you need to reduce it or thicken it up a little bit if you start with these small ones, it's a bigger chance that you'll have a problem, a blowout or something like that. So this one here I'll grab. This is a good example on this back side here. There's all these highlights. It'd be so easy to just light them all up. But again, too much is definitely too much. So I'm going to pick some of the bigger ones and just hit them and maybe this large one up here and that'll be it. There is a nice bright white highlight on this bolt here that holds the air cleaner in, so I'll kind of get that in there too. And final check is just any area that might need a little bit of white that I didn't put in at first, like the bottom of, or the top of the crankcase here, there are a couple highlights here that I didn't put in. I left them out, so I'll kind of drop them in too. All right, and that's it. So that's it, that's that whole air cleaner section. So the bottom, the crankcase is gonna be more rinse and repeat, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a break, I'll finish up that section, and then we'll start talking about clearing this and uh, what we'll do to get this to really pop. All right, so we'll be back in a sec.